Welcome back. In, the, in this, the eighth of ten updates that I'm doing on my 2017 data, I'd like to talk about debt ratios and how they vary across the world, how the burdens are different across sectors, and perhaps even a little bit about the trade-off that determines where the company should be borrowing money. So let's start with the basic trade-off. The real factors that determine how much you should borrow are determined by two big benefits you get from debt and two big costs. In fact, the really big benefit, the one that tilts the scale, is a tax benefit. Over much of the world, interest expenses are tax deductible, but cash flows to equity, dividends and stock buybacks have to come out of after-tax cash flows. For whatever reason, the tax code is tilted in favor of debt, and the higher your marginal tax rate, the greater the tax benefit. There is a secondary benefit, a far smaller benefit that comes from the fact that debt can sometimes make companies or managers in companies more disciplined about how they pick projects. And here's why. When you borrow money, you have explicit interest expenses. If you take projects that are so bad that you're unable to make those expenses, you might go out of business and lose your job as a manager. Now, that's a pretty extreme way of getting your attention, but in some companies, that might be the only way I get your attention. So tax benefits and added discipline. The tax benefits, of course, show up as either higher cash flows coming from the fact that interest expenses are tax deductible to equity, or if you're doing a valuation of a business, shows up as lower after-tax costs of debt. Let's talk about bankruptcy costs. The biggest cost you face when you borrow money is you increase your likelihood that you will be unable to make those contractual payments, interest expenses and principal payments. And if you do, bad things happen to you. So bankruptcy cost always increases. The expected bankruptcy cost always increases as you borrow more money, no matter who you are. Because relative to where you were before you borrowed the money, you've increased your risk of distress. That shows up again as a higher cost of debt and a higher cost of equity as you go to more and more debt. It also shows up as truncation risk, a chance that your company will not make it, a failure risk. Now, there's a secondary cost with borrowing money that you have to factor in. Let's face it. What's good for lenders and what's good for equity investors in business can be two very different things. And here's why. If you're a lender to a company, you want the company to, to take the safest projects they can, perhaps even hold the cash as a cash balance, because all you care about is downside risk. You want to get paid. If you're an equity investor, your desire to take risk is going to be much higher because you get the upside as well. That agency cost plays out every time you borrow money and shows up as costs. The first cost is an explicit cost. Banks and borrow and lenders, when they lend you money, will charge you a higher interest rate if they worry about the fact that you could do something risky with the money. It could also show, show up as restrictive covenants that prevent you from taking projects. Everything in this trade-off can show up in your valuation, but these are the real factors. Now, there are some illusory factors that people get distracted by sometimes when they think about debt. Let's think about the positive illusory factors. There are some people who argue that the best thing about debt is it allows you to earn a higher return equity. Does it? Yeah, in most cases, yes. And here's why. If you borrow money at 4% and invest in a project that makes 10%, that 6% extra goes to your equity investors. So as you borrow more money, your return in equity will go up. Now, before you get too excited, though, Remember, the return equity gets compared to the cost of equity. And if you do your computation right, in the absence of tax benefits, whatever good that happens to your return equity will also push up your cost of equity almost proportionately. There is nothing to be gained from debt if the only benefit you point to is if I borrow money, my return equity will go up. Another illusory benefit that is pointed to when people borrow money is that your debt is cheaper than your equity. Is that true? Yes. Debt is generally cheaper than equity because the person who lends money is the last is the first guy in line. If he charges 6%, the equity investor who is behind that lender will charge a higher rate. That, again, is an illusion because when you replace more expensive equity with cheaper debt, your first sense is my cost of capital went down. But here's what else is changing. Both your cost of equity and your cost of debt are also going up. And again, in the absence of tax benefits, what you will find is whatever you gain by replacing equity with cheaper debt, you will lose by the cost of equity and the cost of debt going up. So higher return equity, cheaper debt are not good reasons for borrowing money. Now, there are also illusory costs that are pointed to from borrowing money. The first and most obvious one is when a company borrows money, it has to make interest expenses. That's obvious, right? And when it makes interest expenses, it, its net income will go down. You say, there, that's all you need. Companies get less profitable when they borrow money. Therefore, they should. What you miss when you say that is it is true you will have lower net income with debt than without debt, but you also are earning that lower net income on less equity invested in the company. 
You also will see po- people point to the fact that when we borrow money, your default risk will go up. And if you're rated as a company with a bond rating, that bond rating might decrease. Is that true? Absolutely. But that, again, is neither here nor there. It is true that when you borrow more money, your cost of debt goes up. But that cost of debt is replacing equity, which is far riskier. You could still end up better off with debt than without debt, even though the debt pushes up your default risk. There's finally a transient factor to consider, which is if you think about a company, it can go raise equity in the equity market or debt in the bond market. To the extent that there's a mispricing of shares in the equity market or an interest rate that's set on your company that is not quite right, given your default risk, you might exploit that difference. And here's how. If your equity is is underpriced, in other words, your stock price is too low, and bankers are lending you money at too low a rate, they're not assessing default risk, right? you will borrow more money and use less equity. If, in contrast, your equity is overpriced and your debt carries too low an interest rate, then, uh, I'm sorry, if your equity is overpriced and your debt carries too high an interest rate, people are charging you, then you're going to use less debt and more equity. The reason I call this transit can cut in both ways, but this is built on the premise that companies actually know when their stock is priced uh, overpriced or underpriced. They know what the right price is and what the right interest rate for debt. In my experience, that's not a great assumption to make. So that's the trade-off. Let's see how this plays out the world using three measures of debt. The first is debt over debt plus equity, or as I I prefer to call it, debt to capital. And you can measure that again from an accountant's perspective using book values or a market perspective using market values. You can just take debt by equity. It's a very close relative and do it again in book or market value terms. And finally, you can also divide debt by EBITDA to get a measure of what multiple of cash flows your debt is. And obviously, the lower this number, the less levered you are. In doing all of this, though, you have to specify what you mean by debt. And here's what I'm going to use in my computations. Through When I computed the debt ratios for my 42,668 companies, by debt, my debt included all interest-bearing debt, short-term as well as long-term. It does not include accounts payable, supply credit, which go into working capital and cash flows. It does include the present value of lease commitments. I've treated them as debt. So keep that in mind as you look at my numbers for the different ratios. Let's start with a cross-sectional distribution of what debt ratios look like around the globe and also in the U.S. The first thing that should jump out at you when you look at this distribution is a significant percentage of companies, more than 25% in the U.S. and almost 20% globally, have no debt. A lot of firms with no debt. Are they being crazy? Not necessarily. These might be young companies, money-losing companies, and they're exactly where they should be. If you look across the world, the most levered parts of the world kind of jump out at you if you look at the debt to capital ratio. One is Latin America and the other is Eastern Europe and Russia. And for in both places, people could point to excuses. If you, to the extent that these are parts of the world that depend on commodity prices, you could argue, hey, that's what's causing it. But for whatever reason, you see the debt to capital ratio highest in those two parts of the world. If you think in terms of debt as a multiple of EBITDA, Canada and China look like they're the most over-levered parts of the world. Interesting difference depending on which measure of debt you use, but this again is just to measure what the debt ratios and debt to EBITDA multiples look like around the world. Now let's zero in on countries. So in this table I've looked at debt ratio, debt to capital using market values, market debt to capital ratios across the world. The red parts of the world are obviously the most levered parts. The green parts are the least levered parts. And again, you will see confirmation of what we saw in the previous graph. You see Latin America and Eastern Europe and, uh, and, and Russia kind of jumping out as red or pretty red areas. You see that China looks okay if you use market debt to cap. But my guess is if I did this graph entirely in debt to EBITDA, you might get a slightly different picture. Which one's right? Well, I don't think it's a question of right. I think you might want to use all three when you think about is, an a, is a part of the world over-levered or under-levered. Now, if you look at sectors, and I'm looking at U.S. Sec- uh, no, sectors of just U.S. companies here, here's what comes out as most l- likely levered and most highly levered. Again, most of these are predictable. Among the most likely levered sectors are technology companies. You've got software, you've got online retail, you've got electronics, a lot of ele- uh, no, technology companies, and people shouldn't be surprised by it. Part of it is many of them, many of these sectors include younger companies that shouldn't be borrowing money. They also have much more difficulty borrowing money, partly because their assets are intangible and people worry about lending them money. 
Uh, and if you look at the over-levered sectors, again, lots of infrastructure companies, right? Power, trucking, telecom. There are a couple of interesting divergences. One is if you look at oil and gas. The integrated oil and gas companies are among the least levered companies out there in a market debt-to-cap ratio. But if you look at oil and gas distribution companies, they're among the most highly levered. Green and renewable energy companies are very highly levered, partly because I guess they're subsidized or protected against default risk, at least on some in, in some parts of the world, some parts of the country. So that's my most highly levered and least highly levered sectors. And you can get the entire list if you go to the data set that's, you know, that, that will be linked to this particular session. Now, 2017 is, is shaping up as a year of change. And where I talked about this in an earlier session when I talked about the potential that tax laws could change. If the tax law just lowers the marginal tax rate, that is going to lower the tax benefits from debt. It could go further. If the entire tax benefit from debt is removed, then debt obviously ceases to be an attractive way of financing. In fact, I would argue that without the tax benefit, the big basis for why we borrow money goes away. And if that happens, the, that might be something that in the long term is good, but that's going to create some some seismic shifts in markets, right? Because if companies have to go from 30, 40, 50 percent debt ratios to no debt, not only is that a big restructuring on the financing side, but the corporate bond, bond market is going to be devastated. I don't think we're ready for that big a change right away. So my guess is that while there is talk about removing the tax benefits of debt, that we will take only a partial step towards it. And that's a good thing, but not a full step. Let's wait and see. When our time will tell. Thank you very much for listening.